This is the fifth talk in a series of seven designed to join up the arts and the sciences. It was first given on the 5th of August 2008 and is being given today on Wednesday the 16th of December 2015. If someone were to say that the Berlin Wall, 1961 to 1989, constituted both a physical and psychic barrier between West and East Germans, this assertion would be understood without much or even any explanation. In fact, it was commonly said in the period after the wall came down that whilst the physical wall was indeed down, it was still standing in many people's heads. This talk is about such double barriers. I'm going to call them liminal points. Liminus, Latin threshold. Notwithstanding that points is a problematic term, liminal points can be hundreds or even thousands of miles long. It is about, on the one hand, both the physical or historical reality of such points, and on the other hand, their psychic reality. It is also about the afterlife of this latter, the psychic reality, which can persist long, long after the physical barriers have either disappeared or become irrelevant. And this is because they have been preserved, frozen in human memory by way of art and literature. In particular, this talk will focus on the city of Tarsus as an illustration of a liminal point. The special goal of this talk is to elucidate the dictum following Voltaire that if there hadn't been a Noah, a Sardanapalus, a Paul of Tarsus, it would have been necessary to have invented them. And it was. Put more plainly, the people in the storybooks, such as Noah, Sardanapalus and Paul, are facilitating an understanding of what has happened to us in evolution. The understanding needs to be given in fictional form because otherwise we couldn't absorb it at all. We don't know enough about biology and we don't know enough about the systematics of advanced evolution or high civilization that we have been living through in the last 5,000 years. We have now, however, reached a moment in history when it is possible to say what that evolution was and how fictional literature is charting it. Tarsus as a liminal point between West and East. Introduction. A. The origins of religion. At a first moment in religion, a member of the species Homo sapiens, let's call him a shaman, is confronted by a vision. At a second moment in religion, the shaman and or the people in his band draw from the phenomenon of the vision a curious and astounding inference. There is another world, a world beyond the one which can be immediately apprehended, a world beyond the one experienced every day. A third moment arises when a question enters into the band members' minds regarding the postulated existence of this other world. Can you get to it? The most basic ideas generated by this question are that, first of all, you might be able to get to this other world via the ground, and particularly via the permeable substance water. And most people will be familiar with the ancient worship, even as late as Greek and Roman antiquity, around springs and marshes. But secondly, you might be able to get to the other world by going up high on, for instance, a mountain. Those familiar with biblical texts will remember the continual reference to worship taking place at high places. Even the idea of worship at the Jerusalem temple is worship on Zion's holy hill. There is, however, a third possibility for the attaining of the other world. And it is by simply traveling across country till you finally arrive at the end of this world, where, for instance, the sun rises or where it goes down below the earth. 
and where the passing of time and the whole meaning of life will become clear to you, or where you'll find dead ancestors who can explain such things. A further idea soon attaches itself to that of the other world and the getting to it. It concerns Homo sapiens' greatest fear, death, and is of this kind. If you just stay in the place where you currently are, you are going to surely end up dead. As other members of the band have done through old age, disease, or ill luck. But if you were to make your way to the other world, a world that might be considered to have magical properties, might it not be the case that you could actually escape the relentless passing of time, escape disease, escape misfortune, and thereby escape death altogether? Building on these early lines of thought in our species, religious thinking started to develop to include the perhaps more sophisticated or even more realistic idea that you personally were unlikely to take this journey below, above or far. You after all have to catch dinner or grind an ax or look after a child and that instead a god, a hero or at the very least an important wise or virtuous person might make that journey on your behalf. The introduction of these abstract notables doing things on your behalf and for which you might have to pay a small fee brought an end to the idea of religion as mere vision or as some solution to the vague albeit pressing fears about death. Suddenly religion had become politics and more than that, for the last 5,000 years, it has become an amalgam of practical politics, philosophy, and moral precept. In this talk today, we are looking at these religious, political, philosophical, morality-driven journeys that go to the ends of the earth in order to give in outline the mechanics or systematics of human evolution that we assert are staring out at us from literature. But just before we go on our investigative journey, let's briefly state what we are identifying as the system of evolution. B, history as system. Here's an alternative world that I have dreamed up. In this Mark II world, the land masses have swirled into continents that are different from our own. You still have, however, a band of tropics and civilization takes root in just such areas. Areas of high rainfall and heat because that is where the biomass is. And the essential component in evolution is food supply, something that Charles Darwin chose largely to ignore. You do, however, require a few other ingredients, like the presence of a river, having two rivers seems to be optimal, and a certain flatness to the terrain, so that when you eventually invent the wheel, you can move your species and goods around with some ease. So in our Earth Mark II, civilization takes root at A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, D. The civilized start to realize that there are advantages to linking up with one another. Trade begins, and with trade you soon have money, private wealth, and very importantly, identification labels on goods. The labels state what the goods are, who owns them, and where they come from. They might at first just be primitive pictographs, but soon people are understanding that there is an advantage to having a completely abstracted system for identifying the goods, their owners, and their provenance. And in short order, you have writing and bureaucracies. As all this is going on, you have the accumulation of a centrally held capital, which gives rise to large-scale projects and the specialists who are involved with them, ones who build monumental civic architecture, ones who make up a professional standing army, and last but not 
by any means least, the priests and potentates to run and orchestrate the activities of the whole organism. The great success of this enterprise doesn't pass unnoticed, and people out in the less than civilized areas start to become curious and envious. People just beyond your A's, B's and C's. This was the broken line marking where they are. But they don't really understand the phenomenon of high civilization. And not just because the civilized are starting to lock themselves in behind their architecture, their city, their temple, their house walls, etc., and cannot readily be seen, but because the not quite civilized can't see how the type of cooperation that exists in these civilized precincts could actually obtain in their own each man for himself world. Nevertheless, the lure of getting their hands on the money, merchandise and political power, especially the power to govern a quiescent mass of advanced humans, proves irresistible. So they resort to various tactics to secure them. They might engage in a quite limited trade with the civilization, usually by the selling of their own natural resources. They might sell their own labor, especially by becoming mercenaries for the civilization, or they might resort to outright warfare. I think that this is the story of how a civilization forms into a symbiosis with a not quite civilization, and then for reasons that have to do with complexity, these form here, now they're down to two, now they're down to just one big group. The peripherals are further out. There's now a drift outwards, northwards in Eurasia. But I still need to say something about the biological background to the symbiotic arrangement. C, the biological basis for a southern and a northern disposition. I'm going to begin this section at just a slight remove by drawing your attention to the term Bronze Age to describe the period 3000 to 1200 BC. Naming a period of 800 year, 1800 years in history from a technology might have its uses. And I have a feeling we'll be referring to this era as the Bronze Age for millennia to come. But thinking that Bronze Age technology is defining for the era, era is problematic and even downright misleading. Problematic because bronze is only used in the most civilized centers in this era. In Cyprus, for instance, just off the coast of some of the most important Bronze Age sites, there have been no finds of bronze, age, bronze tools or weapons for the entire third millennium BC. And this is the island that is named by the Greeks for that most important ingredient of bronze, copper, i.e. kupros. Just by the way, it is a similar story for Anatolia. And on downright misleading, some very careful recent work on the dating of iron tools and weapons has made it clear that these were introduced after the Bronze Age collapse and therefore cannot be at all considered a leading cause of it. I suggest in the light of these points that we instead think of the period 3000 to 1200 BC not as the age of a single technology, but as the age of high civilization. In this way, we can focus on the mechanics of what is actually happening to people in this era. Already we have mentioned the advent of the accumulation of capital, monumental architecture, standing armies, and barriers between the civilized and the not quite civilized with, for instance, walls. All these have psychological consequences. But now let's say something about purely biological developments. When a society becomes extremely efficient in its food storing and food distribution and in its assigning of different tasks, and when it is operating at a very high level of cooperation, 
curious things start to happen with regard to the power of the individual and with regard to sexual expression. There is a massive shutting down of both. Learn from the Hymenoptera, the colonies of you social bees and ants. In colonies of bees and ants, there is a small ruling elite and thousands of workers. Not incidentally, the number of sexuals in the colony can be tiny. In the case of the eusocial bees, the hive can comprise, say, 30 to 40,000 members, with, in the usual situation, only one queen, who is responsible for all reproduction. Particularly noteworthy is that the role of males is profoundly limited. They perform almost no actual tasks with regard to the upkeep of the hive, and their role in fertilization is limited. On the queen's so-called nuptial flight, where all the males, several thousand from the hive, and even others from other colonies, follow after her in a swarm. Only about seven to 12 are able to successfully stab her, each with his single sack of sperm. And for their efforts, they die straight away. In short, it seems that when a species starts to operate at a very high level of cooperation, there follows a curious centralizing of power, including sexual power, and a corresponding drastic diminution of individual power and sexual expression in the rest of the group. So much for high civilization and the peculiarities of the Hymenoptera. The not quite civilized are on the other hand much less affected by this strange state of affairs and can even use it to their own advantage. They retain individual power and the keeping of a large number of males active can make them an effective fighting force enabling them to periodically invade the civilization, steal its goods, and even exploit members of its tame population as a labor force for themselves. Or by slightly adapting culturally, by leaving behind the tents, the habitual violence, and the bitter resentment of accumulated wealth, they can move in and take over completely running the efficient mechanism of civilization from the top. This has been a long introduction, but it was necessary to establish three points with regard to the mechanics of civilization. One, how religion works, its expansionary nature. Two, how high civilization works by way of a symbiosis between a civilization and a less than civilization. Three, a specifically biological aspect, how a species functions under a regime of high cooperation it centralizes power and sex, and how a peripheral group, free of the debilities of centralization, subsists with that regime, perhaps in partial cooperation, but also hatching and even executing plots for a takeover. Now let's see how the mechanics we've outlined show up in literature. Part one, the Noah's Ark story. It is probable that everyone knows that the Noah's Ark story is a great foundational tale for Middle Eastern religion and culture. But let's make sure that we know what an ark is. Anybody that's been to Sunday school would know that it's a boat with a roofed area above a cabin with a hole in it so the two giraffes can stick their necks out. There are, however, some problems with this. Let's begin with the tiny detail that an ark is not a boat. In the English language, there are only two instances of arks that I'm aware of, and both come from the Bible. The term ark is used to refer to two objects. One is the thing that Noah and the animals get into. The second is the sacred object carried around by the Israelites and which in a later period contained written texts. In an earlier period, the ark might have contained either the God himself or stones, stones that either were or intended to represent those used to walk across the River Jordan when passing into Canaan. In Hebrew tradition, however, the terms used are quite different. The term for what Noah is in 
is the same as the one used for what the infant Moses is placed in. And the Ark of the Covenant is described with a completely different term. The Hebrew tradition on the face of it looks like good evidence for an Ark being an object that is supposed to be put in water. Unfortunately, it's not. Our three objects are, however, linked owing to the fact that an ark is a box or chest. Compare the Latin arca. But how, I hear you silently ask, could Sunday school be so shockingly guilty of misleading the young? The answer lies in issues involved with the imperatives of theology. Completely unconcerned that a box at sea would turn over with the first wave and thereby risking the ridicule of any seafaring readers, the biblical writers have gone bravely with the idea that Noah is sealed into a box or chest because the primary significance of the story is that the object should be one where precious or sacred things are kept and locked away. A place safe from the filth of everyday life. The significance of the ark is not, therefore, that it is seaworthy, but that it is sealed. Notice firstly that one of God's specifications is that the ark be covered inside and out with pitch. Genesis 6.14b. Notice secondly the very explicit detail at 6.16b that after Noah, his family and all the animals had entered inside, the Lord shut them in. Thirdly, note that in one of the Mesopotamian versions, the Noah figure has to actually bore a hole with a tool to see the outside world. And this is remembered at 8.6 with the window he had made to send forth a raven. And notice fourthly, 8.13b. The waters were dried off from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. So air, ventilation, the accumulation of excrement over the 40 days, none of this is of any interest to the theologically minded. The good arriving somewhere safely with all their sinning enemies stone dead is what is important. So with the clarification of what an ark is, we can see how the symbols in the story work. The journey to Mount Ararat, to the ends of the known world for a Mesopotamian, is a purely salvational journey. The hero, his family, plus a culled, caged and generally brought to heal nature, and you, the reader, are the winners. Everybody else and all wild nature has been subordinated. In this particular case, for absolute theological perfection, exterminated. But two questions still remain. Is Mount Ararat, or the mountains of Ararat, to go by what the text actually says, really the end of the earth? Thereby qualifying this story to be in the journey to the ends of the earth genre, which I'm arguing for as fundamental for our literary imagination and to representation, representations of the systematic of high civilization. And secondly, why such a bizarre story anyway? Firstly, the ends of the earth. Let's consult the oldest known map. This is the actual object. This is, as it says here, an interpretive redrawing of the original artifact. Babylon at the center, Assyria is sort of wobbled over to the side. Armenia up here, Haban, Haran, and then down here, water and marsh. So Armenia up here, with a little mountain range there, which you won't be able to see, is the land of Ararat, and it is as far north as you can go. Remember, this is a map of the world. And even later map makers seem to be convinced that Taurus, the Taurus Mountains, or an extended version of them, are a rather rigid northern limit for Mesopotamia. 
These are later maps, 194 BC, 124 BC. L along here, a huge ridge going all the way to the eastern side of the world, but starting just above where Tarsus would be. But there is even something more revealing about the Ark's resting place with regard to geography. In earlier Mesopotamian versions of the story, the Ark landed elsewhere. Dilmon, go down here, Dilmon, uh, probably down about here if we understand it to be Bahrain, Mount Nisir, Jebel Judy, Mount Ararat. And then only later in Persian and Jewish traditions do they actually arrive at Mount Ararat. The Ark starting off landing at Dilmun in the Sumerian version, so simply an exotic locale and actually in a southerly direction, probably the island of Bahrain was meant, but thereafter there is a slipping northwards. The entry under Ararat in the Dictionary of the Bible gives an interesting overview of the issues. But I would like to point out one demonstrable error. The writer of the dictionary entry suspects that the resting place of the ark shifted northward as people became aware of a higher mountain further to the north. This is just not the case because Jebel Judy is fractionally shorter than Mount Nisir. So in fact, the resting place drifts north purely on the basis of finding a mountain big enough and impressive enough the more you have dealings with the north and the more your horizons rise northward. Now, why such a bizarre story in the first place? And why so much emphasis on a hero that needs to end up in the north? Here we need to step back well away from the story into deepest history. In the fifth and much of the fourth millennium BC, hardly anybody lives in Mesopotamia. There are probably many reasons for this. I'm going to suggest two. Reason number one is that Neolithic man is not sufficiently adept at water management to live in either marshland, especially a marshland that has a salty backup from the sea, or in a place where rivers can suddenly change direction and much worse cause periodic floods wiping away whole village communities. Reason two is something I don't think you would, be, would readily occur to a modern person the fear of wild animals in wide open spaces. This is a period before the wildcat populations, lions, tigers, leopards, etc., get culled to, for instance, the present levels of near extinction, and a period without the benefit of the famously efficient Bronze Age weapons. Which would mean that the average human being didn't have much of a chance of defending himself or his herds against such animals. So for at least these reasons, early man is on the whole not living in Mesopotamia. In the late fourth millennium, however, the Sumerians arrive from somewhere else. The Sumerians say of themselves that they came from the south and owing to the peculiarities of their language, a language completely different from any of those in the region, it's thought southern India might be likely but also Arabia and even Southern Iran are possibilities. Nevertheless, they seem straight away to be on top of the water management issues. They are dealing with the salt backup, draining the marshlands and mitigating the flood problem with canals. But they are not the only people moving into the sparsely populated Mesopotamia. Some groups start to venture down from the mountains. There is, however, one significant group that is moving in from a completely different source. Transhumans are coming, apparently on a more or less continuous basis, out of Ar Arabia, up here, up behind this settled coastal air, the settled coastal areas of the Mediterranean, so something like this. Up into the well-watered region of the tributaries of the Euphrates, and then down into the plain of Mesopotamia. 
They are also prob probably coming by a much more direct route, trekking across the desert into Western Mesopotamia. So they're going, this is one route, and the other one is they just, uh, just go across the desert. These people are called by the Sumerians, the Amorites. Now here we should, first of all, forget about the biblical Ar Amorites. The Amorites of the Bible function as a sort of spare part or walk-on tribe. This group, on the other hand, represents, and for hundreds of years, a major socio-political headache for the Sumerians. What of the term Amorite itself? The best guess here is that the most notable of what must have been many tribes were called the Amorites. And then that became a generic term. What, however, needs to be pointed out for the purposes of our investigation is that the Sumerian word for these people Amuru is very close in sound to the Sumerian word Amaru, meaning flood. So that from the exact same direction that the major rivers bring their periodic floods come also waves, that must be the right term, of well-armed tribesmen. So the idea of having a flood story is one of having a storyline whereby the righteous, diligent southerners can, in imagination, savor a complete success over northern invaders. The box containing the elect rises up to a level where it can sail over the dead corpses of the enemy all the way to the ends of the earth and to complete salvation. On this latter, we will add in parentheses, parentheses that, unlike the Old Testament's Noah, in the Mesopotamian versions of the story, Zeus Udra, or Utanapishtim, to give both his Sumerian and Akkadian names, is granted immortality for his efforts and is allowed to live unendingly with the gods in a, the remote landing place of his ark far away from ordinary, unrighteous, decaying mortal men. Part two, the Assyrians. The Noah story gives us an insight into the view from the south. What is the view from the north? The view from the capital N north of Assyrian Mesopotamia is incomprehension. The Roman, Greek and Jewish writers completely fail to understand the symbiotic north-south relationship between the historical Assyria and the historical Babylonia and quite a lot else. Rising to the top, so to speak, of the incomprehension, however, comes the truly majestic misconception which reaches its highest expression in the works of Catesius of Cnidus and Diodorus Siculus, that the history of Assyria has only three persons in it. Nimrod or Ninus, Semiramis and Sardanapalus. These latter seem to be based on three actual historical personages but so faintly that as historical recollection, they are close to worthless. Nimrod is based on Tukulti Ninurta I, but in the 13th century, he is ruling hundreds of years too late to be building Babylon as per Genesis 10.10. 10. Semiramis is based on, the, on an actual Semiramis who ruled for only three years in the 9th century and who did not conduct massive invasions of India, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Libya. Also, she did not marry Tukulti Ninurta, who instead of being a younger relative, would have been 400 years older than her. Sardanapalus is based on Ashurbanipal, the last major figure in Assyrian history, who died happily in his bed, probably in Nineveh, definitely not in Tarsus, as per the passage in Arian, and did not commit suicide in a palace fire with his enemies coming in through the windows after a reign that was degenerate and slothful. His rule was in fact vigorous, both militarily and culturally, although he was a book reader. 
which is always grounds for suspicion. Herodotus, when faced with this great historical mess and having twice told his readers that he was going to do Assyrian history, very sensibly doesn't. But we think we can shed some light on what is going on here. Just for now, let's depart on a little historical journey. Back in time to the year 1595 BC, the powerful and well-established King Mercilus I from what is called the Old Hittite Empire is doing what Hittite kings do by way of business as usual and is fighting with his likewise powerful and well-established neighbors, the Hurrians. He crosses the Taurus Mountains into the south of Hurrian territory with a big army only to find that his adversaries are not there. All dressed up with nothing to do, he makes a fateful decision. He will take his army a vast distance south to sack the greatest prize in all Mesopotamia, Babylon. The Kassites, who occupy the terrain through which he has to travel, seeing in this venture advantage for themselves, let his army pass. The sacking of Babylon is a huge success and the plunder is safely transported all the way back to Anatolia. What will be the after story here? The robust and economically energetic Babylonians will pick themselves up and rebuild and Mercilus will live to a ripe old age with his ill-gotten gain. Yes, no, in fact, horribly wrong. Within a year, Mercilus is murdered in a palace coup a war starts between rival factions in Anatolia, which will see the complete destruction of the old Hittite empire. And whilst all this is going on, the Kassites will themselves move south and invade the already smashed Babylon, along with its territories, giving rise to a period of such complete chaos that a hundred year dark age ensues, leaving us with virtually no Mesopotamian chronicling records. That's an interesting slab of history. Could it all happen again? Let's move along in time to none other than Tukulti Ninurta I of Assyria. In Tukulti's time, somewhat unlike the story of Mercilus and Babylon, Assyria lives in a very close symbiosis with Babylonia. Through marriages and treaties, their empires are so closely interlinked that after any war between them, there is only a trivial moving of borders in favor of the victor. And long before the biblical writers are correlating the chronologies of the kings of Israel and with those of Judah, the Assyrians and Babylonians are doing just that with records of their own rulers. Tukulti is however sick of this arrangement and invades Babylonia. He brings the king of Babylon captive to Ashur, along with the statue of the imperial god Marduk and makes himself ruler of both empires. And in a first for an Assyrian ruler, he claims divine honors. Rather pleased with these developments, he goes even further embarks, and embarks on a major building program, including the construction of an entire affiliate city across the Tigris from Ashur, which he names modestly after himself, Ka Tukulti Ninurta. But then things go wrong. His son and heir, together with conservative nobles, possibly annoyed by the sacrilege against Babylon, but definitely piqued by the heavy taxes for the military adventures and the expense of the building program, imprison the king in his own city and set fire to it. Although we are now in the period of the Bronze Age collapse, it's hard not to see in these particular events causes for the decline which will leave Assyria no longer a major empire, only recovering about a century later under Tiglath-Pileser. There is something structural emerging from our portraits. The full-scale northern invasion of the south disrupts an equilibrium between two quasi-symbiotic partners. Classicists might like to compare the story of Agamemnon. He leads the Greek chieftains against the major walled civilization of Troy. And after a long stalemate, Troy is sacked and destroyed. In the period of disruption that which follows, he returns home with his loot, 
and is murdered the moment he enters his own palace. Moving back into actual history and to later times, one can also see points of comparison with the stories of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Now, Semiramis. The world invading and world dominating female is a northern nightmare of a southern phenomenon. And her sex life is of particular interest. She marries no man and has several lovers whom she serially murders. Here we are surely looking at the phenomenon of the queen bee. And now finally in our survey of Assyrian pseudo history, Sardanapalus. I think that his name is a clue to his existence in the minds of the northern writers. It means, according to me, Esarhaddon Apli. In other words, son of the Assyrian king, Esarhaddon, which is what he quite literally is if we take him to be based on Ashurbanipal. To understand, however, the inspecific nature of the name Sardanapalus, and to go further and to see in it a systemic significance, let's go back to the rule of Esarhaddon himself. He is the youngest son of Sennacherib. His older brothers murder their father, an event that is referred to in the Bible at 2 Kings 19.37. Esarhaddon begins a bitter military struggle with the patricides and after much bloodletting comes out on top. Having painfully learned about the problems that go with a dynastic succession, he makes every effort to ensure that on his departure, there will be no repeat of this internecine warfare. And he's got big plans. A crown prince, his first son, will rule the Assyrian Empire, and his second son, Shamesh Shum Ukin, will rule in Babylon. However, the crown prince dies unexpectedly. Another son, the one who will rule with the name Ashurbanipal, is Esarhaddon's new selection to rule Assyria. But his vassals are shocked by this choice of a scholarly, low-profile son. And the second son, Shamash, who is to get Babylon, is, who is still to get Babylon, is also annoyed. Esarhaddon himself dies unexpectedly soon after this. Some time later, 652, the second son and the southern vassals launch a major rebellion which lasts four years and is effectively the end of Assyria as an imperial superpower. The second son, the rebel Shamash, dies in a palace flyer, fire as Ashurbanipal's forces close in on, Banipa, on Babylon. And although Ashurbanipal holds power to his death in about 627, Assyria is soon assailed on all sides by its enemies and Nineveh is destroyed by the Medes in 612 BC. And the point of all this is that again we have a rerun of the story of the northern king trying to establish himself, albeit after his own death, in the southern capital. Again it engenders a situation of disequilibrium and the, the end is a total collapse. And the Greeks designation Sardanapalus for a cognized to be southern and cognized to be empire squandering son, and moreover the son of a father who committed the hubris of dynasty establishment in the first place, shows a certain amount of systemic insight. In summary, in this section on Assyrian monarchs, it is possible to see a principle of imaginative literature in a very stark form. When the person writing an historical account has little or no information, possibly coupled with little or no interest, the account tends towards biological or systemic features, or what can be termed attractors, the points of high biological logic. With Nimrod, it's the case of a northerner who invades and wants to colonize the south. With Semiramis, it's the North's imagining of its worst nightmare. A southerner takes over. She is an emasculating, man-murdering female potentate. And with Sardanapalus, it's the northern invader in a late stage of southernness. 
a man who has fallen into a flabby suicidal decadence, not really a man at all. And all three taken together form a strange nuclear family, father, mother, and son. Part three, Tarsus is a liminal point, Paul of Tarsus and Apollonius of Tyana. In part one of this talk, we looked at the view from the south with the Noah story. In part two, we looked at the view from the north with the burlesque distortions of Nimrod, Semiramis and Sardanapalus. Now we move to texts which seem to evince a more sophisticated grasp of how liminality between north and south works and how it can be exploited. And the way to exploit the north-south divide in an historical era like the first century AD seems to be to use Tarsus as a liminal point. Why is Tarsus an appropriate threshold point between west and east or between, in my terminology, north and south? Because of an intersection between geography, history and psychology. Tarsus, Cilicia and the northeastern core of the Mediterranean have a long history of being barrier points for high civilization. Sumerian influence goes out this far from very early times. The city of Ebla, which was a major power out in this region in the middle of the third millennium BC, and which is called by the book on it in our very own classics departmental center here at the ANU, an empire is the site of a discovery of thousands of tablets in the last century. Of the tablets, 80% are written in Sumerian. Lugal Zagesi of Uma, in about the 24th century, claims that he straightened the roads between the two seas, meaning from the Persian Gulf to the northeastern Mediterranean. Soon after that, Sargon of Akkad is carrying out military conquests in this region. And if we are to believe the later epic, the king of battle, he is out as far as Kanesh, taking on the prince of Purush Kanda, another name for Kanesh. And most importantly, the heroes Gilgamesh and Enkidu are out here on their salvational journey in the dark forest of cedars. Now, a quick run through of periods that are better understood with regard to Tarsus or Cilicia, as a border zone for civilization. In the second millennium BC, the Hurrians extend their influence at the height of their power as far west as Cilicia. The Hittites coming from the north make this region a privileged protectorate so as to facilitate smooth access to the cities of Syria and the littoral of the Eastern Mediterranean. In the first millennium BC, the Assyrians are establishing the western limits of their empire in this region which eventually gives rise to the tradition that the empire losing Assyrian Sardanapalus, having fled from the Medes after the fall of Nineveh, question mark, had died and was buried in Tarsus. Also in the first millennium, the Greeks make their way eastward as far as Cilicia and are well established in the area hundreds of years before Alexander arrives. So it is that, so it is that in the period of Middle Antiquity, i.e. the Roman Empire, Tarsus, the place, becomes Tarsus, the concept, a term in the vocabulary of how West and East or North and South interact. As an acknowledged center of education, it becomes a source locale for Westerners learning lessons in high civilization. It's where Athena Doris, Augustus's philosophy instructor, comes from. It's where St. Theodore, who essentially founds the Church of England, comes from. It's the place where Chrysippus, the staggeringly prolific writer of philosophy, is very closely associated. And it's where the heavily emblematic meeting of Antony and Cleopatra takes place. It is, however, with the fictive heroes, Apost Paul the Apostle and Apollonius the philosopher, that this whole interaction takes on a startling precision. 
Here I am asserting that we have the beginning of an understanding of how liminal points work and how you should position yourself with regard to them if you want to take over the world in a sophisticated age. You say that you were born at or near a liminal point, or you get someone to say it about you. And you say that you have received inspiration from that liminal point and that you are therefore a fit and proper person to go beyond that point, spreading your message throughout the world. Paul the Apostle, effectively the founder of Christianity, functions in this way. As somebody allegedly from Tarsus, Acts says it of him, he never mentions it, and he never drops in to meet relatives on his many journeys into the Greco-Roman world, except at Acts 9.30 and then a bit later, an exception which is very telling. The visit home is completely programmatic. There is not a single detail of the visit, not an event or a name. But as someone from Tarsus, he is a perfect vehicle for the carrying of Jewish tradition to the pagan world. Notice especially with regard to this line of thinking, the story of the Damascus Road conversion. On the road that leads out of the Jewish world of Judea and Galilee to the pagan world of the Syrians, Aramaeans and Greeks, Paul has a vision from God about what his destiny is to be. In other words, at the liminal point, you have a flash of understanding of where civilization has been and where it's heading. And very briefly, Apollonius. The story of Apollonius is rather, a rather sophisticated study in how the North can fight back from the invasion of the Southern civilizers. He comes from Tyana, a suitably modest town just northwest of the Taurus mountain chain, but is educated at Tarsus. We find out that he finds Tarsians overindulgent and pompous. And this is just the first hint that he doesn't regard Southern civilization as anything that needs to be prized. As a sort of anti-Paul, he sets out on a series of Southern-ish treks to the ends of the world, India, Spain, the source of the Nile, to reclaim the territory in imagination for the pagan Greek northern values of simplicity, modesty and abstemiousness and finds that all the worthwhile people at the ends of the earth really know about these values already. In other words, Apollonius is a northern invader of the acknowledged southern civilizations, introducing a sort of systemic element to how north and south stand in relation to each other. The south may have exported a spirit of higher living and higher understanding beyond its borders, but the north can make its own contribution. A curbing of the excesses inherent in high civilizations luxurious success. Conclusion. In this talk, we tried to outline a dynamical system that exists in history, especially the history of the last 5,000 years, the period of high success for our species. It's an aggrandizing dynamic whereby a centralized in location and centralizing in their attitudes, body of humans are coupled up with a more loosely affiliated peripheral body of humans. Owing to the geography of our planet, this successful civilized center versus a fractious, not quite civilized periphery becomes an aligning of south up against north. In the dynamic, the south, despite being periodically invaded and despite periods of complete chaos, is destined to swallow up and integrate the northern groups. After a theoretical introduction which covered A, how the concept of religion is playing a role in this dynamical system with its going to the ends of the earth world dominating heroes and b what the world historical system is and how it can actually be identified in the struggles recounted in history books and c the basis for the two systemic dispositions looking at the southern efficiency of the bees at the cost of individual power and the northern habit of playing along whilst hatching 
and even executing their plots to take over, we moved to an analysis of so-called fictional literature, breaking down the problem into three aspects. One, the case of the Noah's Ark story, which both in its content and in its traditions of a northward shifting periphery is showing the South as completely successful. Two, the case of the northern burlesque of the South, where firstly, the northern invader is being shown to be a potential source of a complete system's collapse, Nimrod, where secondly, there is a depiction of a northern nightmare, an invading, emasculating, destroying female, Semiramis, and where thirdly, a degenerate, overindulgent self-loather becomes a target for more regular troublemakers, Sardanapalus. And three, the cases of the nearly historical Paul of Tarsus and Apollonius of Tyana. This is a situation where North and South have settled into a sort of com mature complementarity, where we are shown how Southern aggrandizements and Northern invasions can function so smoothly across one from the other that we can speak of a liminal arrangement where the two contrary principles are in more or less a happy coexistence. And this despite the fact that both sides have got world domination on their minds. Thanks.